Hello and welcome to episode number 263 of the Armin Show podcast, where the greatness always happens every time. On this episode, we have the author of a book called In Praise of Walking. He is professor at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, the capital. I recently researched it and found out more. And he is on the show with us today. Welcome to the show, Professor Shane O'Meara. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for asking me. Glad to have you on. This is fabulous. Now, I always like to look in detail. That's what I do. I've checked out some of your research as well as the book. I like to look in total because I'm very much about people and how they got to where they are. That's always something I like to look at. How did you get into the field of neuroscience, research in relation to the brain, motion, things of that nature? How did you get to where you are? So, um... That's a great question, um, and the details, I, 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 I'll, I'll skate over the details quickly, so not to take up too much time, but uh, I, I can point to a single incident, which I think is, is a, a reasonable one. My parents went on a holiday to the US when I was a kid, I was a teenager, and my dad brought back a load of books from the States. And one of these books was Carl Sagan's book, uh, Broca's Brain. Uh, which I read, and I just thought this is stunning. Um, you can say things about the world, and you can test whether they're true or not <laughs> by this process called science. Um, yeah. And uh, after that, I, I really was very clear that I wanted to pursue some sort of a career in science, um, and uh, the brain was really the thing I wanted to try and understand because we didn't really know much about it. So that that's the long and the short of, of uh, my interest in the area. Um, then I did the usual things. I went to college, I did a, a doctorate, and uh, I was lucky enough to be appointed to uh, a faculty position uh, where I've been able to do my work um, and be supported by grant-giving agencies. This is the nice thing. Without support, we can't go anywhere. We need people. Exactly, exactly, point. yeah. I always think about the web, and then you have to have the web supporting you in some way. Now, you are in Ireland. Tell me a bit about what Ireland brings to the table. Do you like it? Have you always been there? And has all your research been done there? Do you connect with scientists from there? So uh, I did my undergraduate degree in uh, a, a, a place called Galway, which is on the west coast of Ireland. Next stop after Galway is Boston. Um, so there's uh, <laughs> a lot of Atlantic Ocean between us. Uh, and then after I was in... Uh, uh, Galway, I went to the University of Oxford in the UK, and that's where I, I did my PhD, uh, or as they call it, a DPhil. Uh, Oxford is very grand about these things. Um, and I learned there about the, when you come out of, of an undergraduate degree, you might kind of want to do research, but you don't really know how to do research. Um, and I think the, the experience I had there was really what taught me about how you do research, but also a lot of the things around research, how you write grants, uh, how you publish your work, you know, all of those kinds of things are really, you know, things that you have to be able to do in order to be a, a, a researcher. And then um, after I, I finished my doctorate, I did a postdoctoral uh, period actually in the Department of Physiology at Trinity, um, learning again more uh, by way of neurophysiology. And uh, then after a couple of years, uh, I was appointed to a faculty position. And uh, then I got onto the merry-go-round that we're all used to of graduating students and looking for grant money. There's never enough. And <laughs> all, all of those kinds of things. Hmm. One thing there you point out, what is the biggest difference between the thought of what research would entail versus what it ends up entailing for someone, let's say they were 10 years old right now, trying to separate yeah. the two? So that, that's a really good question. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that you have to get used to with research is being wrong. Um, what you think, uh, what you guess ahead of time, if you're lucky, you might get it right some of the time, but most of the time nature is much more subtle than you are. And what seems obvious at one point in time to be correct, the received wisdom, all of that kind of thing, uh, can be upset quite badly uh, because of somebody coming along with a new perspective 
uh, with a new, new uh, way of doing things, new data. So, you know, neuroscience, for example, has, has been revolutionized uh, in all sorts of ways over the last uh, 20 years. We, we now have astonishing brain imaging machines, uh, for example, so you can visualize the brain at work. Um, and you, you learn all sorts of things that aren't obvious ahead of time. So, you know, there's a, 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 an amazing discovery uh, made in, in uh, Washington University in St. Louis, which I think should attract a, a, a Nobel Prize, and, and perhaps it will. And this uh, is something that, about the brain that nobody had ever thought about. So if you think about the conversation we're having here, mm -hmm. uh, you're focusing on what I'm saying, uh, and I'm focusing on what you're saying. So we're zooming in on the details. Now, yes. imagine after we've, we've talked, um, you might think it back over the course of the conversation. You might think about what you're going to do tomorrow, all that kind of thing. So it turns out that kind of mind wandering occupies about 40% of your waking life. Uh, you know, this kind of zoom out on things. And when you put people in brain scanners and you observe them, when you just tell them, just lie there and do nothing, it turns out the brain is possibly more active when people are given that instruction to think of whatever they feel like, uh, because what they're doing is, is traveling along what's called a mental timeline. They're going back into their past, they're going into their future, they're thinking about who their friends are, what, who said what to who, they're planning about tomorrow or next week or all, all of these kind of big picture details. And it turns out you have a humongous network in the brain, which is called the default network because it's on so much. Um, and you know, 20 years ago, and it's churning away all the time. Uh, but 20 years ago, we didn't know that such a thing existed. We had a, a much different view um, of how the brain works. So you, you can have revelations like that that just change the way everybody looks at a phenomenon. That is a cool concept. I like the churning away. We do all this processing behind the scenes of mapping out. It's very valuable when we, that's why I was recently reading about journaling or something where you write out your thoughts or you put things into play. Then your background churning machine starts working on that. Exactly. I, and, and, you know, if you look at the kind of front end of that, uh, what we do is construct uh, what psychologists call a narrative self. We tell ourselves our story of ourselves and journaling turns out actually to be a really valuable way of figuring out things about yourself and where you're going. Mm -hmm. Or like where you've been. <laughs> or where you've been. Both. I saw that actually in some of your research. They talked about that, where you're going versus where you have been as far as physically. And then also, like with rats, they make a mental model of their region and uh, they can recall certain sections. We do a lot of that. The more we do of that, suddenly we're superpowers in a way. Yeah. Yeah. This is a great thing. Now, one thing I have to point out, this was a, uh, when I was looking at your works, I had never heard of a brain section called the subiculum. You have done research on the subiculum. <laughs> That's cool because I know some brain sections, the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex and the prefrontal cortex and things. And so I saw that and I was like, there's a lot of, uh, this is new. Uh, can you tell us just for variety purposes, what is the subiculum and yeah. how do you look at the brain regions in total? So um, the, you've mentioned the hippocampal formation and the hippocampal formation is, is a major hub for memory in the brain. Um, and uh, it plays a, a very, very key role in memory. However, uh, and lots of effort has gone into trying to understand what the, the hippocampus or hippocampal formation does. Uh, but the key point about the hippocampal formation is that it just doesn't sit there by itself. It talks to other brain regions and receives information from other brain regions. In two major brain regions it receives information from uh, are a part of the brain called uh, the retrosplenial cortex, which is a big piece of tissue that runs down the midline of the brain. And another is a place called the anterior thalamus, which is a big, huge lump of tissue in the middle of the brain. Um, and it sends fibers to, uh, these two regions, among others, send fibers to and from the hippocampal formation. However, uh, they don't go directly to the hippocampal formation. They go through this structure called the subiculum. Um, and it turns out from our work and, and from work other people have done, that the subiculum actually, which has been overlooked as a, a brain region, uh, plays a really, really key role in regulating memory. 
because uh, if you damage the inputs or have damage to the inputs to the subiculum, particularly from the anterior thalamus, uh, you end up with a very, very dense amnesia. Uh, so it, it clearly has some role in integrating information from different parts of the brain, along with information from the hippocampal formation. And the kind of view that we're starting to come around to, it used to be thought, uh, so if, if, you, if you look at the history of kind of studies of people with brain damage, it used to be thought that uh, the hippocampal formation kind of had a role of holding information online for a period of time and was gradually transferred out to the cortex. Um, and that, that's where information was stored. Uh, and then there was a competing view that uh, actually what the, the cortex and hippocampus did was kind of compete with each other. They were complementary learning systems. One was fast, one was slow. And uh, uh, through a process of sleep over days, gradually you would lose your hippocampal memory and it would become a cortical memory. And the view that we've now been arguing for is, is, is contrary to both of those views, this kind of hold it for a while view or this teaching the cortex view, which is that there's actually two routes through the hippocampal formation. There's one which is the anterior thalamus, the subiculum and retrospinial cortex. And there's another which is the hippocampus and then out to prefrontal cortex. And the view that I have now is that actually memory arises as the result of the dialogue between these two systems, um, the kind of coherence that you see uh, between these two systems, which is a very different view to the kind of old, uh, slightly older view. Now, who's to say whether I'm right or wrong? The data. <laughs> so we, we have lots more experiments to do. Hmm. So maybe a combination of both. Is that, by the way, the fast and slow related to like the thinking fast and slow in Daniel? No, no, no. It's a, it, it's, it, it's a much uh, different, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a, a much older view, uh, one going back to, about, to the kind of 1990s. And it, it literally has to do with the hippocampus is seen as a fast learner and mm -hmm. the uh, cortex is seen as a slow learner. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's completely different to that. Okay. But maybe it's more of a both. Sometimes in life, it's like, should we do this? Decision should we do this? It's a both. It's a little bit of both. If you don't mix yeah. both, you're completely lacking in one category. Now, completely, I don't segue smoothly to the book, okay? I have no smoothness okay. in my existence. But in praise of walking, I want to account for It's nice because actually it is a smooth, because you do talk a lot about the brain. Obviously, that's the background from it. It is very nice for this key moment because... There is no time I've seen more people walking than these past two months in full, probably 10 times the number of people I would have seen any other time previously. Why did you select walking as a category to discuss? Was it for the um, red, readily available nature of it as an activity for people to do? What led you to this book? So uh, that's a, a great question. Um, and uh, the answer is very simple. I didn't come up with the idea to write the book. Um, I was having a chat with somebody and we were talking about books and I was talking about books that I'd like to write. And uh, the conversation segued as, as happens and uh, I revealed that I love to walk. And the person I was talking to said, well, why don't you write a book on walking? And I thought, ah, yes, of course, that's what I should write a book on. Um, it's something that was so close to my nose that I couldn't see it. Um, and uh, it was very obvious to me what a book like that should be about, uh, because I, I knew the literature well, and uh, I knew that there had been a lot of advances over, the, in particular in the past 10 years, uh, that really hadn't come to public attention. And uh, no book had been written that kind of gave a, a view of walking from a brain's eye kind of view. So that, that's what I really wanted to do, was to tell the story of how we end up moving around in this world driven by this amazing brain that we have and the method that we have is, is walking, uh, the one we evolved from or evolved to engage in. I like this concept because underneath it, we should always go towards what we are more liking of than maybe something we think we should do. This is why it would come out great and then you finish and you're able to create something wonderful. What do people need to know about walking? Should they be doing more of it? Is it better than other activities because of its low impact? What does it do to the brain? 
So that's a great and very complicated question. So I, I'll, I'll try and answer it in, in a couple of pieces. Okay. So the first thing is we know that people don't walk much now uh, compared to maybe 100 or so years ago. And we know this because we have very good records of what working men and working women used to do in London, for example. Um, uh, they would walk eight, 10 miles a day every day. Um, uh, we know people who are living in what are known as ancestral lifestyles, hunter-gatherers today in, in uh, South America and in, and in parts of Africa, walk, again, astonishing amounts, 10 or 12 or 15 kilometers a day without any trouble. Whereas from the smartphone data, um, we have a great picture of, of the numbers of steps that people take in uh, many countries across the world. Um, and what we know is the Japanese walk the most. Uh, they walk around about six or six and a half thousand steps a day. Uh, and in Western Europe and North America, it's pretty bad. It's around about four or four and a half thousand steps a day. Um, and the country that probably that for which we have data where they walk the least is Saudi Arabia, uh, where they walk around about three and a half thousand steps a day. And the reason that they walk so little is not because of heat, because of course they've had lots of nomadic tribes and, and other things there. Uh, it's because the walking infrastructure doesn't exist. They don't have footpaths and, or side pavements or sidewalks. Um, and we've engineered walking out of our everyday life. Uh, so uh, if you look in the US, for example, you'll see cities like New York, people walk a hell of a lot, actually. Um, and the same is true of Boston and the same is true of, of San Francisco. But there are lots of other cities. Atlanta is a good example uh, where people don't walk very much at all or Houston. Uh, because the uh, uh, environment doesn't encourage it. So we've engineered walking out. So this, this is kind of the, uh, the first thing. So in terms of advice, um, if, if people don't walk, it's in part because the environment doesn't support it. Uh, if you can't walk safely because there, there is no sidewalk for you to walk on, uh, well, then that's a big, big problem. So um, I've never been to uh, where you are, uh, I'm just looking at the, uh, the beautiful view behind you on, on the virtual screen, um, but you, you'll know yourself from, from walking around, I've, I've been to quite a bit of California, but not, uh, uh, anyway, that's kind of, you know, worry about that again. Mm -hmm. um, San Francisco, for example, is, is a really easy walkable city, but other cities in, in, in California are maybe not so easy. Um, so the, the key thing is is the environment you find yourself in makes a big difference to the amount of walking that you can do. If everything is car bound, uh, if you can only get to the shops in the car, if you can only uh, uh, go wherever you need to go because uh, or only in a car, well then, you, then, then that is a problem. Um, now just focusing on the amount of walking you should do, mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of data now because we've got smartphones and uh, other things like this on how much walking people uh, actually engage in. And we've got a pretty good uh, idea of how people's other health status because people are walking around with these mobile laboratories in their pockets. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, quite a few public health physicians take the view that if you're walking less than 5,000 steps a day, you're really not engaging in the kind of metabolic burn that you need uh, to keep yourself healthy. And what you need to be is north of seven and a half thousand steps, and preferably, even though the, the original number of 10,000 per day was made up, it's a great number. And if you're hitting 10,000 steps a day, every day, that's great. Um, and ideally, uh, my usual advice is walk 5,000 more than you're currently doing, mm. because we know most people don't walk very much. So if you add right. on, um, that. Now, you, you brought up the issue of, of strain and those kinds of things. So walking is a low intensity exercise in the sense that the impact loads from walking compared to running are much lower. That the, the, the adaptations that we have for the, where we strike our foot when we hit the ground and that kind of thing spread the weight quite well in a way that uh, isn't necessarily the case uh, where running is concerned. Uh, now, where running is concerned, um, there's a, an, a, we evolved to run without shoes, uh, but now we run in shoes. Um, and if you look at people running in shoes, they strike with their heel. Uh, whereas if you yeah, whereas if you run 
barefoot, it's the, t the ball of your foot, then the side of your foot, then your heel. So you absorb the shock quite differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we run very differently in shoes to the way that we evolved to run. Uh, and what you see when you look at the data is that runners tend to accumulate injuries in a way that walkers tend not to uh, because of slips and falls and uh, splinting and other issues like that. But um, I would never argue that you shouldn't run. Mm -hmm. uh, I think walking should be an integral part of our day. And if you do other forms of exercise, that's absolutely fantastic as well. Um, but uh, in terms of general metabolic health, we all need to be moving more. And uh, if you can build an extra 5,000 steps per day in, that's fantastic. You should do that. Mm -hmm. When I take... I think about walking in terms of the headspace it puts you into. If I take a shower for that period of time, I come up with great thoughts and there's some lively activity going on. It definitely is different than the rest of the day. How is walking in that regard? Walking, I think, is, is much the same. And this default mode network that I, I spoke about earlier on, if you're looking at creativity, the, the kind of the latest research says to us that uh, moments of creative insight happen best when you're flickering between a mental state where you're focused on the detail and a mental state where you're stepping back and looking at the big picture and you're doing that fairly consistently. Um, and I think walking uh, is a boost uh, and a boon to creativity uh, and, and you can show this experimentally. Uh, so uh, there's, there's some great experiments have been done uh, by uh, uh, Marilee Apezzo at uh, Stanford University. Um, and I think the, these experiments give kind of life to the, the view that you've just expressed that having a walker, you know, that kind of thing gives you good ideas. So the idea is that you're brought to the lab and uh, you're handed a succession of common household objects, like for example, a pen, pen. Or, uh, whatever it happens to be. And your job is to write down as quickly as you can, as many uses as you can uh, for each of these objects. And you might come up with, you know, 10 uses for a pen um, in, and then 10 uses for a paperback book or whatever it happens to be. Now, here's the clever thing that she did in her experiments. She got people to either sit for 10 minutes before doing the uh, alternative uses task, or she got them to walk for 10 minutes and then do the task. And what she found was the numbers of ideas that people came up with about doubled in the group that walked compared to the group that sat. And because she's a really good experimental psychologist, she decided, well, we, we have to figure out exactly what's going on here. So she got people to sit on a chair on a treadmill or to walk on a, on a treadmill and do the experiment again. And you got exactly the same result. The movement is the thing. Um, and in a beautiful twist, a, a group in Taiwan uh, recently did a, a replication of this study. But instead of, of uh, looking at the... Uh, the business of the, the treadmill. What they did was compare people in their early 20s to people in their early 70s. And what they found was that the group in their early 70s who walked for 10 minutes before generating ideas came up with twice as many ideas as the seated group in their 20s. So there's a 50 year age gap here. <laughs> and uh, what it shows is that movement and walking in particular is a great boost to creative idea production. Um, and the more general lesson is when you're stuck, don't sit there, get up, move around, go for a walk. Right. That relates with that concept of physiology comes first and then. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we're afterwards. By the way, I like that. I think you mentioned in the book that based on um, walking, your age is almost based on your walking. I'm kind of butchering it, but uh, you don't get old until you're not walking anymore. As long as you're walking, it's really delayed. Yeah. How old yeah. I, I, I actually, it's funny when I, when I wrote that sentence, I had this kind of idea. Have I heard something like that before? Uh, it turns out it was George Bernard Shaw, the, uh, the, the, the playwright had actually written something along the lines of, uh, you don't stop playing because you're old. You only get old because you stop playing. Um, and my idea was actually, but you don't get old until you stop walking. <laughs> um, and uh, walking actually 
uh, is one of those things that we're built to do from very early in life and we can keep it up until very, very late in life. And because of all the good things that it does for us, um, we should keep it up uh, for as long as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. It really is within our form to take that as a first step. And then after that, our great creativity and socialization can come. One thing that comes to mind based on regions is I noticed that the, let's say, for example, in Europe, the northern part, UK, Finland, Norway, Switzerland, these are some of the most intellectual countries that we know of. And uh, is there something to more walking, colder temperatures? Uh, have you noticed any of these connections? I've noticed that a lot of research comes from more the north and colder climates and then also walkability. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. That's a, a, an interesting thought, isn't it? Maybe in the more northern regions like where, where we are as well. Uh, you spend more time indoors because <laughs> it's too cold to go out. I, I, I don't know is the, is the honest answer. Um, mm. I suspect there's a lot of other things in the mix. Um, you know, if we were having this conversation 500 years ago, you might have said England is quite a primitive place and Spain is where it's at uh, because uh, it was an immensely... And of course, Italy 500 years ago gave us the Renaissance. Um, uh, so... You, you know, maybe maybe there's a kind of a cyclical thing um, where one country is top of the pile for a hundred years, and then it gradually shifts, and another country uh, takes over or whatever. It's handed over to somebody else. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe unwillingly, but uh... here we give it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's, never, it's never that smooth. Yeah, it's a valid point. What would you say are uh, is walkability the biggest? Do people just naturally want to be walking? Is there any other things that really keep them from building it as, as a part of their routine? Yeah, I think that the built environment, uh, like we all live in towns and cities now, mm -hmm. uh, is really the major constraint. So to give you a simple example, in the building I work in, um, if uh, my, my office is up on the third floor, if I want to get there, uh, when I walk in the main foyer, the lift or the elevator, as you call it in the US, is just there. If I want to get to the stairs, I have to go through four fire doors. Um, so the default is going to be the elevator. Right. Uh, whereas if the building was built in a different way where the elevators are stuck in the corners and you can't see them very easily and the stairs is in front of you, we will take the stairs. Uh, humans take the line of least resistance and uh, we're built to conserve energy, but we're also built to walk. So if we design the world so that we can walk around a bit, uh, we will do it without thinking about it. Um, and this happens everywhere you go. So uh, uh, if you make it easy for people to walk, people will walk. If you make it hard for people to walk, people will drive. Uh, they will take the elevator or whatever uh, it happens to be. Mm -hmm. That makes me think of the new Apple headquarters. It's a huge building that's circular. And they made it so that it's walkable and you'll run into other colleagues regularly and there's windows and uh, you can see the trees. They thought of a lot of things that create an environment. The environment's a big deal. I guess we don't do so much beyond our environment because the environment comes first. I used to think that we, we make it in a way, but actually it really imparts upon us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I used the old line from Churchill. Uh, in the book that we make our buildings and then our buildings make us. Uh, and the, the point there is that if you build a building in a particular way, that's the way you have to use that building. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to get around easily in a building, uh, you can, the architects have to make decisions about where are we going to put the stairs? Where are we going to put the lifts? Where are the corridors going to be? What are the services going to be like? And when they're in place, they're there, you know, for 50 years or however long the building is going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're kind of stuck with it once it's in place. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if I was to go back and redesign our building, uh, I would put the elevators in the corners <laughs> and uh, I would put the stairs uh, very centrally so people can walk around and see into offices and all of those kinds of things. So we can meet each other on the stairs and have conversations, uh, which is a difficult thing to do now. Mm -hmm. For entertainment purposes, I have had in the past uh, Mary from Scotland on the show. I have had a professor from University of Manchester in England on the show, the different parts of the UK. You are in Ireland. 
as far as the UK and Wales, uh, what area of the UK would you say is most walkable or what areas come to mind as most friendly to them? Uh, well, I don't live in the UK, so uh, hard for me to comment. Uh, right. But um, I, in terms of walking, the, the place in these islands I've enjoyed walking the most is London. Oh. Um, London is a, a fabulous city to walk in. Um, here in Ireland, I think... Uh, there are a couple of places that are, are fabulous. Dublin is a lovely city to walk in. Um, uh, the mountains to the south of me here in Wicklow are, are fantastic as well. Um, I've intended for years, but never managed to do it, to go on a hiking holiday in Scotland, um, in, in the Highlands. Uh, and I hope to do that sometime, but at the moment, <laughs> it's not going to happen because there's no travel. Uh, <laughs> so for the moment, uh, I, I'm stuck with walking where I am. <laughs> right. There's less of this moving around currently. Yeah. Which gives people a chance to settle. It's nice. I usually think of it like periods of expansion for maybe some years, and then there's a period of, con and the, of contraction. Yeah. yeah. I think they're very healthy in some ways because everybody's able to like, oh, let me clean out my closet. Let me think about these people who have been around me the whole time. Or yeah. Something. That's a wonderful thing. Has there been any specific scientists in recent years or books in recent years that have inspired you in some way, like in the past decade? Um, oh, so I think there's been a, a couple. Um, you mentioned thinking fast and slow at the uh, early part of the conversation. And I think that book by uh, Daniel Kahneman is, is absolutely fabulous mm -hmm. uh, and really is, is well, well worth reading. Um, I, I think that the kind of way he, he parses how we think is really important. Uh, and the idea that you, you kind of come to by the end of that book is that we should be treating our thoughts as hypotheses. We shouldn't be treating them as kind of an essential core of our, of our being. But I, I, another uh, book that I, I, I got great uh, value from is uh, Walter Michel's book, uh, The Marshmallow Test. Uh, where he talks about hot and cold cognition. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I, th I think the kind of key idea there is that um, uh, humans have, have this marvelous uh, brain system that delivers answers really quickly, and it can deliver it with emotional valence. And then we have this other slower system that comes along, <laughs> puts the brakes on. Um, if he, 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 the kind of core idea there is, of course, if we can just take a second before acting because this is what our big frontal lobes are there for us to do. They just take a bit of time to, <laughs> to do it. Uh, we'll all benefit uh, uh, much more. I, and I think also just to, to pick on a Californian uh, who's, who's quite close to you, Robert Sapolsky, at Stanford, uh, his book Behave is uh, a really marvelous read. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an absolutely cracking read from uh, start to finish um, and, I, and I would highly recommend that as a, as a book uh, for people to, to, uh, to read as well. Now that's one I liked very much. That was one of my early, I did uh, text interviews. When I was doing text interviews, I interviewed about Behave. Wonderful book. That's one of the biggest books that I've read in hefty detail and taken notes on. <laughs> yeah, you, your, your wrist is sore after reading it. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a lot here. But it, but it is, a, it's a fantastic read. It, it, it genuinely is a, a I, I, what I like about Sapolsky's book is that uh, he, he places uh, the discussion of brain and behavior clearly in a comparative context. Uh, you know, we are primates and there are other primates that just happen not to be human ones, but they have, you know, similar kinds of issues to us. You know, they've hierarchies, they get stressed and all of that kind of thing. And he also puts it in an evolutionary context. So we, we can see continuity in stress hormone levels, for example, in other species and how they're managed and, you know, all of those kinds of differing things. And, uh, and I think that that's a really useful thing that he's done in that book. It, it, it kind of spins the way uh, that we think about things, not the, just the uniqueness of humans, the humans in the context of other animals. There's always a connected network. We can't discount that. It's a very important quality. Sometimes when we do things, it's like it's so binary and it's by itself. It's never the case. One thing I wanted to go back to slightly because I just remembered it, but as far as um, 
the challenge of walking, like if we make a robot to do walking, it's very, very super du- difficult. There was a computer game like five years ago where you had to like control all the muscles to make something walk and everybody would fall when they tried to do it. Yeah, it's terribly hard. <laughs> Is that connected to how it gets the brain going? Because it's like a default system. The brain has to run all that. So then it gets you back in like a cognitive state. Yeah, so the, the, there's, a, there's a lot of different things going on there. Uh, and it, that's a horribly complicated question you've asked, I'm afraid. Um, I, and I'll, I'll try my best to give an answer. So mm-hmm. if we look at how humans walk, uh, the first thing to say is that we don't come into this world as walkers. Right. Uh, we come in basically helpless uh, and we learn to crawl. And crawling is a really important developmental stage because you have to work the muscles of the shoulders in order to crawl so the rotator cuffs get moving. Uh, you have to make mo- movements of the spine uh, in order to, 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 uh, to crawl. And you have to make uh, rhythmic movements of your knees and, and your hips and all the rest of it to, to move around. Uh, and then when you start to, to walk at around about, let's say, 12 months or so of age, um, this is a really tough process. Um, and a child... Uh, Karen Adolf at, at New York University has done very elegant work on this. And what she and her group have shown is that a child to learn to walk starts off uh, and as they're getting really into the phase of learning to run around at maybe 14 months or so of age, they're doing about 2,300 steps an hour and they fall about 17 times an hour. Um, so falling is an important signal to the brain that you're doing something wrong. Um, and that you have to correct what you're doing. Uh, and it, so it takes us, let's say, from 12 months to maybe 20 months to go from being crawlers to walkers. So that's about eight months or seven months. Mm-hmm. That's a hell of a long time to train a body and a brain <laughs> mm-hmm. to just do this thing where you're on two feet. Right. Um, so that, that, that's kind of the first problem, uh, is that we have, we have a genetic program that unfolds that has to be trained by movement in the world. So that's mm-hmm. not like what happens in a robot. Then the other thing that happens, uh, which is quite different to, to how robots are built, um, are the rigid parts of our bodies are our bones. Uh, and the non-rigid parts are muscles and the, the, the soft uh, tissues. And the brain is obviously a soft tissue. Um, and it has to... I, I'm, Rather than how I think some roboticists might have thought about balance, um, as far as the brain is concerned, the body is hung from the brain um, and hung from the head. And it's the head that moves through space by making contact with the ground. So the job of the brain is to animate the body, get the muscles uh, contracting in the right fashion, in the right order. So this is called a muscle synergy uh, to allow you to move. Um, and if you uh, damage the signal from the brain, you get muscle flaccidity and the muscles can't operate anymore. So uh, the way to think about walking from a, the brain's point of view is that your head effectively is floating and your body is hung from your head. And the sensors that are really important for walking are the ones that are in here in the inner ear, uh, the so-called vestibular system. And the job of the body is to guide this complicated head through space without falling over. <laughs> this is true. It made me think of my, I have a friend who, uh, she had like a stroke recently because of some complication and then had to very quickly adapt it back to walking, like walking was uh, affected and then very quickly got back to it and is walking smoothly again. But almost you could see it like return development wise, like a child. And yeah. The brain kicks in and it's like, oh, well, I got to adapt here. Can't fall like this. Gotta yeah, you got to learn. And, and you, you see all sorts of interesting phenomena, actually. All, uh, you know, stroke patients have taught us an awful lot about how, for example, the visual world interacts with our, our vestibular system. Uh, and uh, if you have, for example, damage to the vestibular system, you can stand upright because you've got a, uh, you can sense what the, the upright is uh, through the visual system. But if you close your eyes, you'll fall over. Uh, because that visual input is lost. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. That's just like the helicopter sometimes when they're in the clouds and then they no longer have the visual stabilization. So then if they don't use their instruments, they're in trouble. Yeah, you, you can't tell which way is up and which way is down. And, and this kind of, 
sense of gravity, of course, is one of the most important things. Uh, we have to know which way is up and which way is down in order to, to be able to act against the force of gravity to walk around in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was that issue with that recent helicopter with the Kobe Bryant that they had. He was supposed to be on visual flight rules and uh, then he went to instrument or he didn't go to instrument flight rules, which would have used a computing system, which can use like satellites or whatnot to assess where the ground is. Yes. Now, uh, one thing I always like to check in a form of closing is what is a message you would tell all people about your research and what you would want them to know if you had a megaphone to all of humanity? If I had a megaphone to all of humanity, um, walk more, you'll benefit from it in all sorts of ways. And we will all benefit from it uh, because walking is more than just an individual act. It's a social act. Um, we evolved to walk uh, as, as bipedal animals in, in Africa, all those hundreds of thousands of years ago. And we spread out all over the world in groups and families and tribes by walking. This is what we evolved to do and we need to re-engineer our societies to do more of it. That makes sense. We can bring it back and a lot of people currently are in this moment. Professor Shane O'Mara, I would like to thank you for having been on this episode of the show. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Same here. And we are out.